On this first day, we need to ask the question, why Tama? Why Tama? But before we can answer this, we need to know what Tama is. Then we can move on to considering why we need to study and practice Tama. I'd like to give you a quick summary of the meaning of Dhamma. Dhamma or Tama is the secret of nature which we need to know in order to develop life to the highest possible results for the highest possible possible benefits. When we talk about developing life to the highest level, we're talking about developing life so that it is free of all problems and all dukkha, all tukkha, so that life is completely free of any, everything that is appropriate to the meaning of the word problem and everything that is appropriate to the meaning of the word tukkha. This is what we mean by developing life. We need to speak about secrets a little bit, or about the secret. When we understand the secret of something, then we are able to practice it or carry out that thing successfully for the highest results and the most benefit. For example, the explorations of outer space or the things that have been done with atoms, atomic power and nuclear things. These have only been successful through the knowing of the secrets of these things, the secrets of space and the secrets of the atom. So this is allowed developments in these areas. The same thing is true with life. In order to develop life, we must know the secret of life. So we're going to talk about the secret and the specific secret of the secret of life. This is what we need to look into. The secret of life is Tama or Dhamma. And we can say that the secret of life is in Thai, Tamachat. Tamachat is usually ex explained or translated as nature. But the meaning that many Westerners give to the word nature is quite different than the word Tamachat. Tamachat means something which exists within itself, by itself, and of itself. So when we say nature, this is the kind of meaning we're giving to it. So the, the secret of life is tama, is nature, that which exists in and by itself. When we speak about the secret of life, and we're speaking about Tama, we can talk about the four meanings of Tama. The first meaning is nature itself. The second meaning is the law of nature. The third meaning is the duty that must be performed according to that law of nature. And the fourth meaning is the fruit or benefits that arise out of performing that duty according to the law of nature. These are the four meanings of Tama. So I need to t ask you to take a look at yourselves, or more specifically as, at these bodies and minds that we imagine to be ourselves. So take a look at this body and this mind. If you look, then you will see nature. 
you will see that, that the body and everything else is nature. And then you will see the law of nature. And in this body and everything, we can see the duty that must be performed in line with that law of nature. And then fourthly, we, we will see the results of performing that duty. If the duty is performed correctly, the result will be well-being, tranquility, and coolness. But if the duty is performed incorrectly, then the result will be tukka, unsatisfactoriness, discomfort, um, anguish, pain, frustration. So this, we can see that if we look at the body, mind, and everything here, we will have all four meanings of the word tama or nature. So when we really look at the body and everything, we will completely see all four meanings of the word tama or the word nature. All these four meanings are right here. And when we see these four meanings, then we will understand the importance of the meaning of the secret of life. In seeing these four meanings, in seeing nature, then we will we'll see that, begin to see that we don't completely understand it all yet, that we haven't truly penetrated to the secret of what we call life. We haven't really grasped this secret of Dhamma. And so to fully understand these four meanings, we have to really see the secret of life. And so let's take some time to study this matter until we understand it sufficiently to go on. Let's also consider the word development. When we talk about developing life, we usually don't have a very clear understanding of what this means. And we have almost no understanding of how far life can truly be developed. We don't realize the highest benefits that are available to mankind. And so we don't take much interest in the secret of life which enables us to reach those high levels. And so in talking about developing life, we need to realize and understand how far life can truly be developed. And so this is another point which we must consider and understand. So when we talk about developing life, we mean developing life to the highest possible level, the highest, most supreme level that is possible for humanity. This high level can be described as to develop the mind or develop, to develop life so that it is above all problems, all problems whatsoever, to develop life so that it is completely above and free of all levels and meanings of the word problem and all levels and meanings of the word tukka. For those of you who haven't heard this word before, tukka is a word that can be translated as unsatisfactoriness or suffering, conflict, agitation, it's all the things that disturb life. Dukkha is what we're running from all the time. It's what's interfering with a life of calm and ease. When life is developed above all Tukha, then life has reached its highest possible level. Now, some of you have probably never really seen some of the problems that are afflicting your life. Many people have never really looked 
closely enough at themselves. And so they just think at, that all these little difficulties and problems are the normal, ordinary way things are. And so they look at they, themselves and they say, oh, I don't have any problems, everything's okay. Because we've learned to accept all these things as normal and ordinary. So we need to take a very serious and close look in our own lives and see if there really is anything that we could call a problem. Is there any dukkha? Is there anything unsatisfying or disturbing about our lives? This is something to look, look at within yourself. And this is very necessary to do when we come to a place like Suan Mok. Because if you haven't looked inside and in, you aren't aware of any problems or any tukkha, then there's no value in studying the Dhamma. The Dhamma can have nothing to offer you unless you realize that you have some problems. So don't forget to take a good look inside and see what's there. So when we talk about developing life, we can we can explain this in four areas or under four topics. We can say that there are four aspects of developing life. The first aspect is to prevent dangerous things from arising, to prevent dangerous things from doing anything nasty to life. The second meaning is to to clear away, to get rid of and destroy any of the dangerous things that have arisen in life. The third meaning is to, to give rise to, to produce and to have progress in things which are useful and beneficial for life. And then the fourth is to maintain and protect and preserve things that have already occurred and that are useful and beneficial. So these are the four aspects of developing life. Getting rid of or preventing the arising of dangerous things, getting rid of dangerous things which have already happened causing useful things to arise and maintaining the useful and beneficial things that have already arisen. The development of life is our duty. This is the direct meaning and importance of the word duty, to develop life. This is the duty of all human beings. In order to develop life, we must have in our possession four very important tools. We can call these two, four Dhamma tools or four Dhammas which we need to develop life. These four tools of Dhamma are Sati, mindfulness, Sampachanya, wisdom in action, or applied wisdom, banya, wisdom, knowledge, and samati, concentration. These are the four tools which are needed to develop life. So the practice of vipassana meditation, insight meditation, is a way to develop the mind, to train the mind so that these four Dhamma tools are developed and increased. So this is why we need to be interested in meditation, in vipassana practice, in order to have these tools that are necessary for the development of life. 
As far as this thing called mental development or vipassana meditation, there are many, many different kinds of this available, many different techniques for developing the mind. But of all the techniques which we have come across, of all the different practices that we have seen of and heard of, the one that is most useful and most powerful is called Anapanasati Pawana or mindfulness of breathing meditation. The practice of mental development based in mindfulness of breathing. And so this is the practice that we will be talking about in deal from here on, in, in detail from here on. The correct meaning of anapanasati hawana is that we study reality or we study nature. And we do this by taking one aspect or object of nature, of reality, and we study that object every time we breathe in and every time we breathe out. So this is the meaning of, of mindfulness of breathing meditation. To take some object of nature and study it while we are breathing in and breathing out. And while being mindful of breathing in and breathing out. This is the correct meaning of mindfulness of breathing. This is a very powerful secret of nature which you ought to understand. So we're going to repeat it some more. This powerful secret of nature is that if you want to know the reality of anything, of anything whatsoever, the way to do it is to study that thing, to study the reality of that thing within the mind to whatever it is you want to understand and know, you take the reality of that thing within the mind and study it there every time while breathing in and breathing out. While there is the awareness, the knowing of breathing in and breathing out, that the reality of that thing, that truth within the mind is studied analyzed, scrutinized, observed until it is the reality of it is seen while breathing in and breathing out. This is a most profound secret of nature which enables us to develop the mind and realize the truths of nature that we need to know. Actually, the meaning of anapanasati can be quite broad in general. In its most general sense, anapanasati means to, to think about or to reflect upon anything while breathing in and breathing out. This means that you could be thinking about your home in some foreign country while breathing in and breathing out. That would be a form of anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing. Or you could think of your mother or your wife or husband or your children or your family while you are breathing in and breathing out. This is the broadest meaning of mindfulness of breathing. But that's not what we're interested in doing here. Instead of just taking anything as the object of the mind, we take Dhamma, truth, reality, nature, as the object of the mind. And we take specifically aspects of nature, specific truths, which when developed and used, will free the mind of suffering, of Tukha. So in the Anapanasati we practice here, 
we take certain specific dhammas and our study them while breathing in and breathing out. And in so doing, we develop the four dhamma tools of mindfulness, wisdom and action, wisdom and concentration, which we mentioned earlier. So this is the kind of anapanasati that is most useful. So now we have to ask, if you're not already asking, so what are these these dhammas, these truths of life that must be studied? What are these truths that must be be studied within the mind, that must be brought into the mind and studied there? What are these dhammas that we need to know? The answer to these are the secrets of the body, or the secret of the body that is we need to know in order to extinguish tukka. The secret of the things we call the feelings, the vetana. The vetana are, what we mean here is that whenever there is sensory experience, such as seeing or hearing, there is a reaction of the mind that is either pleasant satisfaction with the sense experience or unpleasant dissatisfaction or a neutral kind of uncertainty. These are the feelings. And the secret of these feelings is the second secret we need to know. The third secret is the secrets of the mind. And then the fourth secret are the secrets of ultimate reality, of the profound truths of the way things are. So this is what we need to uh, bring into the mind. These are what must take place in the mind and be studied within the mind. These things are so important to know that I'd like you to memorize these four basic things that we need to study. And I'd like you to do so with the Pali word. Then you will have the most clear understanding later, and this will be of great reference to you in your meditation practice. So the first thing is gaya, gaya, or body. Gaya, vetana, or vetana, vetana. Then citta, citta, the mind, and tama, tama. So, gaya, vetana, citta, tama, tama. Please remember these four things. These are the four important things that we need to study within the mind. These have to arise. We have to learn how to develop these within the mind and study them there. This is because these four things are already taking place in life. These are the four fundamental aspects of life. But they are also the source of many of our problems. Because we don't understand these four things, all sorts of problems are happening in our life. Because we can't control these four things, because we can't keep them within balanced limits, they are a source of tukka. So thus it is very, very important to study these four things, gaya, the body, or bodies, vetana, feeling or feelings, citta, mind, and tama, truth, reality, nature, whatever. So let's look at these, each of these four in detail. The first one, gaya, this word gaya literally means group. And it can apply to all sorts of groups of things. But in this case, we're sp speaking specifically of the group of things that are compounded together into what in English we call the body. And in fact, the English word body also has this meaning of group. 
So when we say Gaya, we're talking about a group of different things, of different organs, of different elements, which are compounded together into this body. So this is the meaning of Gaya. We need to study this Gaya and see how it exists and what it is like. And most of all, we need to study the one very important subcomponent or component of this body, which we can call the breath body. In this overall body, or this body group, the flesh group, there is one subgroup, which we can call the breath, or the breath body. And so we need to study this breath body especially. And we need to study how the breath exists, how it, how it acts, how it changes, and also what influence it has on the rest of the body. This breath body is very, very important but we, because we can see that it is the thing which sustains life for the rest of the body. If this flesh body were to lose the breath body, that it would no longer be able to maintain itself. So we can see the breathing as that which sustains the rest of the body. This points out a very, very important relationship that we need to study. Now this overall body, this flesh body, is something that we cannot directly control. That is not within our abilities. However, we, there is a way to indirectly control it, to master it or to gain mastery over it. And this is by using the breath body. By using the breath body properly, we can, we can control the overall flesh body. So this is something that we need to study and learn about. And this is what we're talking about when we talk about the secrets of Gaya or the body. So in the first steps of the practice of mindfulness of breathing, we work with the Gaya. Specifically, we're, we work with the breath body. So what we do is we study the breathing. We study all kinds of breath. Every kind of breath that occurs, we note it and study it. Short breaths, long breaths, calm breaths, violent breaths, fast breaths, slow breaths, gentle, all these kinds of different breaths which arise, these need to be studied. We keep on studying them in order to to understand the characteristics of the breath and the conditions of the breath. And we just keep on studying the breath constantly. Each kind of breath that arises, note it, clearly see it in order to learn about it. And after doing this for a long, long time and becoming clear about the nature and characteristics of the breath, then we can begin to study the influence of the breath body. The breath has a great influence on the rest of the flesh body, on the rest of this physical body. And this influence needs to be seen very, very clearly. So after studying and observing all the many kinds of breath, then we must observe and note this influence of the breath upon the rest of the physical body. And we do this until we see absolutely clearly that the breath in the rest of the body are completely, very closely interrelated to the point where we see that the breath body conditions the flesh body, that this breathing conditions the physical body. When we see that the breath is the conditioner of the physical body, 
then we will begin to understand the secrets of the body. So we can summarize this first, these first steps of the practice by saying that in studying the gaya, the body, and especially that component of the body which we call the breath, that we will see that this breath has a very important and strategic influence upon the flesh body. And we see that the breath body, the breathing, conditions or is the conditioner of the flesh body. This is a very important secret. And this secret can be used to unlink unlock other secrets about the body, such as the, the fact that we can use the breath to gain mastery over the body. It is not possible, for instance, to calm the flesh body directly. I don't think anybody can sit there and just make the body absolutely calm directly. But by using the breathing, by calming the breathing, by making the breathing more and more gentle and peaceful, then the flesh body will become calm and peaceful. So this deeper secret is that by calming the breathing, the flesh body becomes calm. When the flesh body calms, there arises joy and happiness, some very, very nice vetana or feelings and many other useful things also will happen. Okay, let's imagine that we fully understand the secret of the body. After that, we need to understand the secret of what we call Vetana. The Vetana or Vetana, these feelings, are the things which have the highest and most powerful influence on human life. These feelings have, abs have very powerful control over what we do. Not just the, this is not only true of human beings, it is true for all living creatures, for all living things, that the Vaitana influence life in a very powerful way. So we can say that the entire world is controlled by the Vaitana. And so we need to really look into these things. We can see that when there are happy feelings, pleasant feelings arising, that the, the mind is enslaved to these things and does what it can to get more of these feelings, to sustain them. And so these pleasant feelings are always pulling the mind in a certain direction and conditioning certain kinds of activity. And then the unpleasant feelings, which we, we don't at all like, these condition the mind in a different way. These influence life in another direction, but still leading to all kinds of habitual responses. So these Vaitana have a very powerful control over, over life in what we do. And this means that to be free, we need to understand these things which, which dominate the world. We can say that the whole world is within the, the circle of these Vaitana. The whole world is trapped within the influence of this conditioning of the Vaitana. If we study Dhamma, we also know that there are other things which influence the mind. But we can say that the Vaitana have the strongest and most powerful influence. And so it is necessary for us to understand the secret of these things that we call Vaitana. I'd like to say a sentence which you may laugh at. I'm going to say it anyway, and if you want, go ahead and laugh. If we can master the Vaitana, we will be able to master the world.
if we can control the Vedana, we will control the world. You may not believe this, but you can see that in this world where there is nobody interested in controlling the Vedana, nobody has any interest in getting any mastery over these feelings. And so we can see that the world is out of control. Nobody controls the feelings, and so the world is completely out of control. There are all sorts of crises and problems arising constantly. All you have to do is open any newspaper and you can read about them. All the wars, the famine, the corruption, the pollution, all these things are because we are, are not at all interested in controlling the feelings, in getting any mastery over them. If we could completely control the feelings, then we would control the world. This is something you need to consider. We can say that the Vaitana are the focal point, are the meeting place for the arising of all the causes of problems in the world. The Vaitana is the place where all the causes of our problems happen. Everything, all of our problems have their causes centered around the Vaitana. It's because of Vaitana that there is craving, that because there is hunger and, de and ignorant desire in the world. Because of our craving, our hunger for, these kind, for this and that, we do all kinds of activities. So these causes of problems, these, this craving, our ignorant desires, and the various activities we do that are inspired by these cravings, these all arise centered around the Vedana. If we could have control over the Vedana, if these could be kept within safe limits, kept within reasonable bounds, then the causes of problems would not be able to arise. And so life and the world would be free of these problems. So if we can understand the secret of the Vedana, then we will be able to control them. And by knowing this secret of the Vedana, of these feelings, then we will know the secret of controlling the world. Now for those of you who believe in things like reincarnation and rebirth or transmigration, of spirits or souls or whatever. If you want to bring this transmigration or whatever it is you believe in under control, the way to do that is to bring the feelings under control because it is the feelings that lead to rebirth in this way or that way, in heaven or in hell. So you need to understand the secret of the Vedana. To know the secret of the Vedana, we need to understand a few things about it. First, we need to, we need to study and understand the Vedana themselves. We need to see them as they arise in the mind. These feelings as they happen within the mind, that these, these things that the mind feels, these need to be known. This is the first. The second is that we need to see how the Vedana condition the jitta. You'll need to, you'll hear this word jitta quite often, so I might as well explain it a bit. In English, we have the word mind, which we generally associate with the head. And we also have the word heart, which most people put somewhere in the chest. When we use the word jitta, it would include everything that is meant by mind and also what is meant by heart. So we could say that jitta means mind and heart and consciousness. But the jitta, you can't stick it in the head and you can't stick it in the heart. You can't locate it in such a crude way. So we need to that's a little reference for you 
to understand this Pali word jitta. The second thing about the feelings that need to be understood is how the feelings influence the jitta. Before we talked about how the breath influences the physical body. There is a very, there is a parallel relationship between the Vedana and the Jita, the feelings and the mind-heart. So the second thing to know about the Vedana is how they influence the mind or how they condition the mind. This is the second thing. And the third to know is that by controlling the Vedana, the mind can be controlled. This is also parallel with what happened with the breath in the body. So there, is these, there are these three things that make up the secret of the Vedana. Seeing the Vedana themselves, seeing their influence, their conditioning power upon the jitta, <coughs> and then seeing the secret that by controlling the Vedana, the citta, the mind-heart, can be controlled. The first steps of the practice, or the first step of the practice related to the body, and the second step related to the Vedana follow the same principle. So it's helpful to compare the two. In the first step regarding the body, we find out what it is that conditions the body and then we study that thing. We study that conditioner of the body until we know it in great detail. And then we study how that thing conditions the body. And then by controlling that thing which conditions the body, we can control the body. This means that we control that thing in a way that the body becomes more calm and peaceful. So in the first step, we learn how to get control over the body, how to master the body by gaining mastery over the breath, the thing that conditions the body. In the second, where we're dealing with the, the feelings, the Vedana, we need to, at this point, start to get control over the mind, the jitta. And so we see what it is that conditions the jitta. And the thing that conditions the jitta is the vetana. And so we study the various kinds of vetana until they are seen in great deal and fully understood. Then we see how, how it is that the Vedana condition the mind. We study this relationship, this conditioned relationship. And then lastly, we see by mastering the Vedana, by controlling them, the mind will develop in ways that we, we want. We can cause the mind to be in certain states by our mastery over the Vedana. For instance, the Vedana can be calmed in such a way that the mind will become very calm and peaceful, very tranquil. So this is how the first step regarding the body and the second step regarding the Vedana are parallel and shows how they follow the same basic principle of development. In the first step, we study the secret of the body. In step two, we study the secret of the feelings. And now in step three, we study the secret of jitta. Um, let me point out that we don't go on to this step three until we have fully mastered steps one and two. We don't go hopping around. But when we have mastered steps one and two, then it is time to look into the secret of the jitta. The jitta is what leads life. The mind is the leader 
and the body is just the tool which is led around by the mind. So if mind is what leads life, it is the director and leader of life, then this mind, the jitta, must be brought under control. It must be mastered as well. The jitta, or in Thai, jit, jit in Thai, jitta in Pali, is a very subtle, very fine and detailed thing. And so it is very, very difficult to study. And for this reason, very few people bother to study it and are completely ignorant of the way it works. But this doesn't mean that it is impossible to study the jitta. All of us are capable of studying the jitta and able to learn its secret. So don't, don't be frustrated or depressed or give up on the necessary practice of studying the jitta because the jitta has such a primary role in life that we absolutely need to understand the secret of the jitta. Now the thing about the jitta is that we can't really know it directly. It's impossible to directly know the jitta but we can know the jitta indirectly through the things we call thoughts. So the way we study the jitta is by studying the thoughts. The thoughts are the conditions or the symptoms of the mind, of the heart. So when we say thoughts, we would also include things like emotions and, and other things. The way to, to point out this this important truth is that take the example of electricity. You can't really see electricity itself. So what we know are the symptoms of electricity, current, um, voltage, and all those other things, power, and the various attributes or symptoms of electricity. But we are unable to know the electricity itself. And so it's the same with the jitta. We can't directly experience it, but we can experience the thoughts. So during the day, how many different kinds of thoughts are arising? Many, many, many different kinds. And so we can study those thoughts. And by studying these thoughts, we can come to know the jitta through those thoughts through those symptoms of the mind-heart. So now, in order to know the secrets of the jitta, remember that in step two, we came to understand, or we got control over the vetana, that which is the conditioner of the jitta. And so now in step three, excuse me, in getting control over the Vedana, we learned how to master or control the mind. And so now there is control over the mind. The mind can be made to think in any kinds of different ways. The mind can think in this way or that way, whichever way it wants. So in order to study this, we can make the mind be satisfied or dissatisfied. The mind can be in a state of liking or disliking. The mind can experience different kinds of happiness and joy. It can be made to be glad. It can also be made to be unhappy if we decide to do so. Then the mind can be concentrated. It can be concentrated in different ways, on different things, mm -hmm. on different levels. And then finally, the mind can be liberated. There are many things which the mind attaches to. We can make the mind let go of those things. And there are things which attach to the mind. And we can make, the, we can liberate the mind from those things. So in studying the secret of the mind, this ability to, the, 
to control the mind is used to study the, the jitta in these different ways. So after learning the secrets of the body, the feelings, and the mind, when these first three parts of the practice has been, have been fulfilled, then we come to part four, or step four, which is to learn the secret of truth, to learn the most supreme secret of life or of nature, which is the ultimate truth of all reality. And so what the secrets that we have already learned, we take these secrets up and use them to study the supreme secret of all nature and all life. And so by looking at these various things, we uncover the various facts of life. We study these things until we see these, these ultimate truths, such as the ultimate truth, the truths of anicca, dukkha, anatta, sunyata, and tathata. Anicca, or impermanence, the truth that all things are in, that all conditioned things are in a state of impermanence and flux. Dukkha, the fact that all conditioned things are susceptible, can be the cause of tukkha. All these impermanent things are unsatisfactory. The truth of anatta, that all things whatsoever are not self, are not soul. That in none of these things is there a soul or a self. Sunyata, that everything is void. Everything is void. And here we mean void of an I, of a me, of mine, of self. This is voidness. And then lastly, the highest, most profound truth, da-ta-da, suchness. Everything is just, just this, just thus, only thus. So in the fourth part of the practice, the ultimate truths of everything are studied. And in this way, when the mind understands these truths of all reality, then the mind will not make any more errors. It will keep itself on, a tr on the path of correctness so that no mistakes are made and that no more dukkha is caused. So this is the secret of the fourth part of the practice. This is the final secret. It may make you laugh. It may be a bit amusing that this highest truth of all, that the ultimate truth of everything whatsoever, of the entire universe and everything in the universe, that this highest truth comes down to nothing but suchness, <laughs> to da ta da. In Thai they say chen nan eng, which is something that people say to a small child when its toy breaks. Oh, chen nan eng, don't worry about it, it's, it's only that, that's the way things are. This is what it means, da ta da. It's just this, it's only this, it's, it's thus. And nothing different, it's not in any other way, it's just this. This is the ultimate, most profound truth of everything. This is where it all ends up, in this truth. That everything is thusness, or suchness, this way. It's not good, and it's not bad. It's not positive or negative. It's not a gain or a loss, not winning or losing. This isn't an advantage or a disadvantage. It's just da ta da, the state of being thus, the state of being just like this, free of, of positive and negative, sin and merit, virtue and demerit, and all these things. So this, this is the, the kind of amusing end. This is the ultimate truth of da ta da. 
that needs to be seen to fully realize this ultimate secret of all nature. Now in this fourth part of the practice, it has within it four steps. The first steps is to see the truth of all things, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, not self, voidness, and then da-ta-ta. As we begin to see the thusness of everything, the da-ta-ta, as we begin to realize da-ta-ta, then attachment to things begins to break up. This, atta- this habitual tendency to attach to things begins to dissolve as we begin to realize da ta da And as attachment begins to break up and fade away, then attachment ends. There is the ending or cessation of attachment. Once attachment has ceased and ended, then the mind is free. So this practice ends in the mind realizing that it's free. However, when the Buddha talked about this, he used the word that we can translate as throwing back. The Buddha said, at the end, we throw everything back. The meaning of this is that we are all thieves. We have been thieves for all our life. We've spent our whole lives stealing things from nature. We take this and we claim it to be mine, my body, my mind, my thoughts my this, my that. We've been stealing things from nature all along. But at this step, the last step of this practice is to realize, oh, (laughs) it's nature's, it's not mine. And then we start to throw everything back to nature, having realized that it doesn't belong to us. And so this is where the practice ends. First, the mind penetrates to the ultimate truth of da ta da In realizing this truth, then there is the fading away of attachment to things. You can't attach, attach to something when you see that it's only da ta da then there's nothing to attach to. As attachment fades away and dissolves, then there is the cessation of attachment, and then the throwing away, the throwing back of the object of attachment and the mind is free. This is the fourth part of the practice, to realize this this deepest and most ultimate truth or secret of nature, the secret of Dhamma. All religions end in the same thing. We call this emancipation. So this practice we've been talking about of anapanasati, ends in emancipation. And to this word emancipation, we give it the meaning that I have just described. This throwing, this ending of attachment and throwing everything back to nature. This is our meaning of emancipation. Other religions may give some other meaning to imagine to the word emancipation. That's up to them but we understand it as we've just described. So the practice of anapanasati is a systematic process, a natural series of steps that leads to emancipation. Today we've talked about it in a general way. We've given a a general outline of what happens in the practice so that you will have an overview of where this practice goes. This practice leads to emancipation, and we've tried to show that to you today. In the following talks, we will supply the details of how to practice mindfulness of breathing in order to emancipate life. So for today, we will end at this point, and later, we will continue with the details of the practice. Thank you for coming. So now the meeting is closed.